He's dressed in the coat of many colors, but as so as a Nigerian, he started out in Hollywood in the early 2000s, when living in bondage was a mania, throwing up Nigerian filmmaking with remarkable film stars. Something close to BB Nigerian mania these days, you might say, because Nollywood had its bad boys and bad girls. It was, and it's still a blend of Nolly, Nigerian, Holly, American. And that is how Obi and Meloye got noticed by media and entertainment channels and multinational corporations. To those extent, he's a member of the British Film Institute, BFI, and a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants. He also teaches at the University of Huddersfield, United Kingdom. Obi Emiloye is also CNN's feature of Nollywood personality who braved coronavirus. Take note to film via Zoom link in 2020. You're welcome, Obi Emiloye. Thank you very much, my brother. Uh, uh, when I, when I say you're dressed in coat of many colors, we get along and see how you're dressing. You're only dressed in coat of many colors because I, 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 I mean, my coat of many colors. <laughs> yeah. You've done so much in Nollywood, in uh, what they usually call United Kingdom, Nollywood, Nollywood, United Kingdom. You've done so much in America. So let's kick it off. What are you doing now, given your reputation as on, you know, the most, as a most awarded filmmaker in contemporary African cinema? Um, all right, thank you, my brother. Um, first of all, that is open to conjecture. Some people might, might say that, um, statement is wrong um, but it's not it doesn't mean very much to me i i am a filmmaker focused on myself i i don't see competition i compete with myself i do my best to to tell the best stories possible to push them the best i can so that the world can see them so i i don't thrive on the number of awards that i have I know I have one of you, and I'm grateful for those, but I don't remember that. Every project is new. Every project is, is a new beginning. And, 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 and they say, he to whom much is given, much is expected. So there is a huge expectation um, that you carry on your shoulder because of who you are, because of what you've done in the past, um, that weighs somehow heavy. Um, and some people can't even manage it. They say, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, the pressure is too much, but you know the pressure is what makes me wake up in the morning. Um, I thrive on it. I, I thrive on trying to you know be the better version of myself every day. Um, yeah, so that statement is um, is a burden to carry. So how do you keep factoring in your international production experiences? You know, pulling your accent, recent uh, rounds with blackmail on UK and Nigerian mm -hmm. screens. I know you brought, you brought a black male to, especially yeah, to this compound, you screened it, and it was, you know, a, an audience, uh, you know, hit. So uh, how do you keep factoring in your international experiences in such productions? I, I, everything we do in, in the film in, industry is a continuum. Um, unfortunately, there is no arrival. You cannot say, I've arrived, because, there's no last bus stop in this industry. As soon as you get to the next bus stop, the next bus stop beckons. So it's about continually improving yourself, working in a continuum. Um, so, so for me, whatever you do in the past is, is in the past. You step on the shoulders of the people that have come before you. You step on the shoulders of the other projects that you've done in the past with the experience that you've gained. And then you face this completely new challenge of the new project. Like I'm working on a film right now in pre-production for this film. Um, and it's, you know, it's like starting from the year 2000 because you have to do pre-production. You have to find the money. You have to agree the cast. You have to plan the production. You have to fit that into all the other things you're doing. So it, it, it helps that you've done it before. It helps that you know the ropes. It helps that you have the contacts in the industry and you have the, you know, the skills and the skill set and the specialization that you that you require to make a project. But each project is a different kettle of fish. So, it, so, so that's what I'm saying. That's what, that's what I'm saying. How did all that build up to making a beautiful film like Blackmail? And if you want, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to talk about Blackmail a little bit. You know, in that you know situation. Yes, blackmail. So, you know, we, um, we, it was 
2020 at the beginning of lockdown, I've just come back from Nigeria and everybody was in, at home doing nothing. My wife was on the phone on, on Zoom to, uh, um, to, to her work colleagues and, and, I, and I said, we must do something. And that evening, I, I got an email from some fraudster online that said, oh. you know, <laughs> we've, been, we've, been, we've been watching you for the past 40 days. We have video of you doing all sorts of things in the house and oh. blah, 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 blah. We'll would expose you unless you give us um, $2,000 in Bitcoin. Uh. I said, I showed it to my wife. I said, what is this? And she said, oh, it, it's spammers. I should forget about it. But I couldn't forget about it because at the beginning of the email, they mentioned my password. And it was correct, even though I had changed the password like a month before. So it, it spoke to me. I said, what else do these people know? So that night, I started changing the passwords to my uh, social media accounts, to my banking apps in Nigeria, to my banking apps in the UK. All right. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I said, but why am I worried? I don't have anything to hide. I know these people are fake, but why am I worried? So that night, I started looking for... Um, I started looking for stories that dealt with um, cyber security or cyber insecurity, as the case may be. Uh, and, I, and I found only one, a, a TV series on, on Netflix called um, um, Black Mirror. And the particular episode was titled Shut Up and Dance. And I watched it. And it, and it had this, you know, post-apocalyptic view of of the world, everything was coming to an end, you know, really dark story. I said, if nobody has told a story of how cybersecurity affects you and I, anybody that has had a, an email address, then there's a gap here in the knowledge. Yeah. And I think so, to tell that story. That night, I started writing the script. Yeah, for that's Man. right, that's cool, that's very cool. I mean, you've used the word apocalyptic, and I'm looking at the early 2000s. When you were mixing with stars like Regina Askia, Sandra Jones, Sentu B, and Ritan Zelu, Charles Okafor, Mimi Song, Katie Enshaw, and Liz Benson, among others, how did, can you, in a way, compare these apocalyptic times in the, in the 21st, or in 2023 or 2022 with those days? How did that, all that affect you, you know, you know manage your growing up in the industry, mixing with all those stars? You know, Nollywood is a is a great place. Um, it's a perfect industry where you can be who you want to be. You can come in irrespective of who you are, irrespective of the training you have, no matter how old you are, if, if you are short or tall or ugly or fine, whatever it is, you will find a space in, in Nollywood. So in the early 2000s, I packed up my things and said, uh, Spent at that time seven years in London, and I wasn't and I wasn't welcome anymore. I didn't like the place anymore. I wanted to go back home with a burning, you know, enthusiasm to say, you know what, I want to go and. And unless of, you were an accountant you know, or a lawyer. No, 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 no. I wasn't <laughs> not very far from an accountant. I qualified as a lawyer. I practiced for a little while, but everything you are goes into everything you do. So. In fact, the fact that you are a lawyer, the fact that I played professional football in Nigeria for Rangers and Julius Vega before I came to the UK, all of those things oh. add to who I am. They add to my personality, they add to my to how I see the world. Yeah. They add to how I tell stories because, you know, you can imagine if I'm doing a, a drama that concerns law, my insight will be different from that of any yeah. other director. So it's it's you know, we are we are complex beings and everything that has happened to us goes into becoming whoever it is that we are. You can also so as I was talking about you can also see where I say you can also see where I say you you wear coat of many colors. <laughs> yes, I think when you get to my age, it's my birthday in the next few days, I will be fifty six. Okay, years happy old, birthday. Happy birthday yeah. in advance. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It means that you would have you would have gathered some moss along the way. And I think having lived the life that I've lived and worked as hard as I have, you know, at 56, you you are about consolidating. 
Um, and it's not, it's not, it doesn't require any special skills to do that. All you have to do is continue going. And at 56, you would have, you know, some momentum to be able to, to call yourself an expert in something. And, and that's what happens to me. So it's not, it's not, it's not a special, not special. I'm just a village man from Itapa South local government area, Fremont State, um, who's doing something he enjoys. Well, you, you gathered so much experience, you know, when you were in Nollywood or when you came back to Nigeria and got involved with Nollywood. How did those experiences serve you as head of production, Ben TV, UK's first Afro Afro-Caribbean channel in terms of time, budget, quality, themes, actors, and distribution? Now, I'm really looking at the nitty-gritty of film production, if you would want to discuss them, because, I mean, this is about educating people who are listening to us now or watching us now. Yes, you know, once again, everything you are goes into everything you do. So when I came to when I came to join Nollywood in in, in 2020, uh, no, sorry, in 2000, Jesus, <laughs> 20 years later, in 2000, um, I met an industry that was very informal. I met an industry that had you know um, DVD and the VCD at its mainstay. I met an industry that was controlled by um, a cabal of marketers. Marketers. I mean, that's true. <laughs> they were very, very powerful. Grow, uh, powerful people. <laughs> you know, and, and my experience wasn't a nice one because all the dealings that I had with those marketers turned sour, all of them. Oh. You know, I guess it was maybe there was MAGA written across my face. Um, I was a young returnee from from London, I had a little bit of money, I had my own studio, I was doing my own films. So in a way, they saw me as soft target. And every single distributor that I worked with cheated me. It, it was so frustrating that I had to go to Jumota and lock people's shops, drag them out of their shop and lock it with big, big box. Cost commotion in Jumota. I remember, I remember I, you remind me of when uh, Charlie Boy went with a, a gun to get his money from a producer. How did he want to pay him in those days? <laughs> I, I didn't go with a gun. I went with my muscles. I was a strong man, a young man at the time. <laughs> I would them out of their offices, lock the gates with big padlocks, and, and the whole Dumata Gada to beg me. You know, so, so such was my frustration that after one year of doing that, I've learned a lot in terms of filmmaking because you learn more from doing than yeah. from, you know, pontificating and from lectures. So in working in the industry and making about five or six films in that one year that I spent, I got a lot of experience. Mm. I, I, I discovered what worked. I discovered how to relate with an audience, yeah. you know, how to do an audience. So it was a, it was a huge learning curve for me, yeah. a very sharp learning curve. And when I was frustrated economically by the marketers, I packed up my bags and came back to London. And I told them that I would be back, you know, just like an old Schwarzenegger. I said, I will be back. Yeah. And my comeback film became The Mirror Boy in yeah. 2011, which opened up a new vista for myself as a, as a filmmaker and for the whole of Nollywood, which is the, the new Nollywood evolved with um, better films, better stories, more attention to details, the cinema culture, and that has blossomed into what we have today. And that served you well so at Ben we, TV. We let that, that to Ben Television. So when I came back to, to, to the UK, um, Alistair Shoyode, who is the founder of Ben Television, contacted me and said, look, we need a certain quality in our production. You know, Alistair is not a broadcaster. He's uh, an entrepreneur who saw an opportunity. Uh, so he, 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 he knew the, the commercial side of things. He didn't know the production. Very long because I, I got I got um, involved in other projects that moved me away from it. But it was while it lasted, we made some very interesting programs. And what I did in Nollywood, that experience of being in the field, working, grafting, was a huge help in terms of bringing the same work ethic into the television uh, station um, for Ben TV. And you know, Ben TV is no longer on air. But while it lasted, it was very strong channel that really connected Nigerians with their home. And I was a small part of that. I'm really thinking about, I mean, you're teaching now in a university. You have experience in, uh, in Nollywood. 
you have experience in the UK film industry. When you want to encapsulate all this and model your own maybe filmmaking culture between the two continents, what is your feeling about, you know, uh, mutual interchange, mutual benefit in terms of lessons, in terms of education, in terms of skills acquisition, skill transfer. What's your comments? You know, I I occupy a very unique position in African cinema. Um, I am very grounded in Africanness. Mm. There are very few Africans who are more African than me, I would say. But I also have the ability to to see things from a slightly different perspective, yeah. which is a more global, more you know, um, universal perspective. Yeah, and that's a very unique position. And I, and I, and I, and I, while I celebrate that, while I use that as a as a means of giving my project a certain taste, a certain um, uh, uh, reception with the audience, yeah, it, it's something I'm also researching. I am. Um, I'm completing my PhD in December from Goldsmith University of London, and my my PhD research is on Nollywood mm. and how can integrate um, the the international angle of Nollywood storytelling and Nollywood yeah, filmmaking. Beautiful one, beautiful one. To, and look, you know, so to to create what I call um, a, a hybrid of Hollywood stroke Nollywood, which is happening with the advent of um, the big players, Netflix and the likes, into Hollywood. Mm. There, is, there seems to be emerging uh, a hybridization or a kind of a hyphenated Nollywood that is not the old Nollywood, but yeah, something so, fresh. Some people, some, say, mm. some people will say neon Nollywood with the old one, <laughs> for the old one. It was a neon Hollywood. So I, don't know about, you, I don't know what you would call it, yours. I don't know the other day. <laughs> it's, it's a, it, 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 nomenclature doesn't really matter. What matters is the substance. And the yeah. substance is that Nigerian storytelling is improving. The quality of film production, the quality, the, the attention to the details, the, 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 the factors of production are being paid attention to. And, and the, the, the quality of what we're doing is, is, is rising as reflected in, in the viewing figures in the cinemas and on, on some of those platforms. So it, it, it's something that would happen anyway. Whatever people choose to call it, whether they call it New Nollywood or call it New Nollywood or they call it, um, you know, uh, the advent of, of the authentic Nigerian cinema, whatever you call it, the mm -hmm. fact is that Nollywood is progressing. Um, we, we are transcending those borders that were put in front of us because of the medium of our uh, distribution, which was DVD. Now, with um, virtual distribution through streaming and all of that stuff, we are everywhere. People can sit in China and watch films. I get responses for um, emails from Brazil and, and Ecuador and you know El Salvador for people that have watched my films. I've never been to those places. So that's the reach of Nollywood. It's about this very international filmmaking practice that squeezes out every ounce of value from small budgets that would not shoot a shot in other territories. And that's Nollywood. It doesn't have to be Nigerian. This is what we trans, this is what we we sold to Ghana. This is what we sold to Cote d'Ivoire and all of those places that have taken the Nollywood module and they are adopting it and adapting it to suit their purpose. It's it's it, it's great what, what has happened with Nollywood. And when you consider that Nollywood is not there's no place called Nollywood. It's a bunch of independent filmmaking practices who are just hustling. But globally, they have this very sharp front that people think, you know, there's somewhere in Lagos you go to and you see Nollywood. No, unfortunately, everybody is in their studio doing their thing. But the world sees the effort and, and, and the impact um, on, on, on global storytelling. Look at FESPACO, what happened in FESPACO. FESPACO is a francophone uh, film festival that happens in, in Burkina Faso. Um, last month, Nigerian film was the opening film, and the Nigerian film by my good friend CJ Obasi also won the, the, the Critics Award. Yeah. So in, in the past, in the past, they, they never used to accept Nigerian films. They called us low quality, um, straight to video rubbish. Now we are opening the festival. Now we are winning awards there. 
So it is, it is that Nigerian spirit, that never say die attitude, that can do attitude that makes us rise from the, that, the, the that, height of that can do that can do Igbo attitude. <laughs> it's not Igbo attitude, it's Nigerian attitude. Okay. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm still talking to Obi Emiloye, CNN's uh, feature of Nollywood personality, member. Of the, with the membership of the UK Film Directors and uh, Guilds and the British Film Institute. It's nice having you on this program. So let's go on. Can you compare and situate Nollywood's low budget filmmaking from screenplay to screen in the US and UK, where you have worked with perhaps better uh, skill crews and cast? What I'm looking at, now you've already mentioned it, you already, you've already talked about it in a little way, in a, a little bit. But I need you to go into the integrity of budgeting, you know, crewing and casting a little bit so that we can understand. Every film is the same. Every film director is trying to tell a story, to pass a message. Whether the budget is one billion or it is 10,000 naira, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you are trying to tell a visual story with every tool that you have in your arsenal, with every tool that you have in your resources. And, and it's no different. So when, to give you an example, when I was approached by University of Huddersfield to, to come and start their filmmaking course, that's a, a UK university. That's, you know, that has been in existence for 159 years. They're asking this Nigerian filmmaker to come and start their filmmaking course. Mm -hmm. At the time, I wasn't looking to be a teacher. I'm not a, I'm not a teacher. I'm, I'm not cut out to be um, very regimented in that teaching sense. I'm a free spirit, and I like my independence. But when the offer was made to me, I felt that that offer wasn't a personal offer, that it transcended me. Sure, that it was sure, a case of, sure, you're right, you're right. And it was a case of Nollywood being recognized as a veritable film industry in the world. Yeah. And what major practitioners is being invited to not just come and be a lecturer in, in film studies and analyzing film. No, a lecturer in filmmaking. Oh. So I designed the courses. I designed the cinematography and camera work. I designed editing and, and storytelling. I designed light camera action. I design, I'm teaching, I am assessing. I am a bunch of young British students. I have um, about 24 in my first, in my second year, which I started with last year, and about 50 in my, in my, uh, um, in, in my first year cohort. So a bunch of young, young British creatives who are depending on me, this Nigerian filmmaker, to learn the craft of filmmaking. That tells you that filmmaking is, is a universal language. It doesn't matter if you're telling Indian stories or a Chinese story just won the Oscar yesterday. You know, so, so that tells you the world is open for business with whoever tells the story. It doesn't matter where the story comes from. It doesn't matter what the language of the story is. If you tell a good story about a human experience, every human being, wherever they are, would relate to it. And, and that's what, you know, validated my decision to know what, to take this job because it was not about me. It was about my industry and I needed to accept it on their behalf. And for two years, I have been doing it. I have been gaining more experience, you know, getting some kind of contextualization, the theoretical context, contextualization of my practice so that I, it, my next film is going to be a better film because I see things slightly differently, not just from filmmaking perspective, but from the point of view of theory and practice. So. You know, it's it's you know it's um it's it's a great thing. So, whatever story you're telling, whatever budget you're working within, it's it's about telling, it's about communicating that story. So, for for argument's sake, blackmail was shot um, with a budget that would not shoot a short in the UK, but we shot a film, a feature-length film that went on to show in in a hundred cinemas across the UK, which is absolutely the record for a British made black film, you know? So it's shown in, 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 in hundred cinemas, made decent uh, money. It, it has been, you know, reviewed by every single uh, mainstream press from Variety to Hollywood Reporter, 
to the British newspapers, to the BBC, to Sky, everywhere. So it is a simple, small budget film that has taken on this, you know, life of its own just because people connected with the story. So I, I, I'm not one to talk too much about budgets because it's studied very well. And it's not because they, they didn't have the money. It's simply because the story did not work with people. So budgets, it no matter at all. It is the story you tell and how well you tell it from the heart that will determine the success of a film. Okay, wrapping up your experience from Ben TV and your self taught companionship, becoming mayor of UK Film uh, Directors Guild, what really is your cinematic style and statement? I know you said, I mean, you are Nody Wu styled uh, movie maker who went to the UK, but wrapping up, what's your statement? How, how would you say, some people wake up and say, okay, uh, there is an author, you know, author, director with such a statement. What's your statement? What's your short statement? I think the author theory is a, is a French um, concept which attempts to see the filmmaker, the film director as some kind of author, mm. you, know, you know, kind of equating the process of filmmaking with the process of writing a book. I, I, and I, I'm not particularly, you know, a big fan of of that theory mm. because I think filmmaking is a very collaborative process. Um, I think uh, editors in films deserve more credit than they're getting okay. in Hollywood and Hollywood because that's when the story is made. That's when the film is made. You know, the editor is the the corrector of everything wrong with the film. From if the script is wrong, the editor has an opportunity to correct it. If the directing is wrong, the editor has. If the cinematography is wrong, if the acting is wrong, the editor makes choices that affect the quality of the film. So you know, Spielberg, when he was nominated for his latest film, mentioned production assistants as being the core of his filmmaking work, and these are people who are paid very little, who run around carrying lights and and dragging things around and making sure that the production happens. So there are lots of people within the process who are who are very important. The director takes a lot of the credits and I I would take that because that's the that's the way the, the convention of the industry works. However, I value the people that I work with, I value their input, I celebrate them. I, I, at every opportunity, I mentioned that this is not about me. This is about the team, from the writers down to the production managers, down to the visual effects people, down to the guy sitting in a dark room in America who writes the music of the film, and down to the guy sitting, Shiloh, sitting in, in Nigeria, doing the sound design, recording all the folly and all of those things. These are the guys that make the film. So, you know, do I have a statement? Do I have a, a style? I would say, short of telling a story from the heart, I don't. And, and I've reflected that in, my, in the range of stories that I've told. I've told um, child-centered um, adventure films like The Mirror Boy, that made it work. It worked commercially, it worked critically, won a lot of awards, opened a thousand doors for me. And if people thought I was gonna be typecast as this um, young storyteller, uh, or, or uh, fantasy storyteller. No, the next film was Last Flight of Abuja, a disaster thriller. And I made it work commercially. I made it work critically because, you know, people, you, you want a, a, more awards than The Mirror Boy. And, and people felt, okay, he's a blockbuster storyteller. He's going to give us the next blockbuster where something happens on a ship. No, I went ahead and made Onyozi a comedy with a Kei Bakasi that looked at, you know, some level of spirituality and, and, and the luck of the Igbo guy you said about the Igbo guy's Kandu attitude. I explored a bit of that. Yeah, that I film. remember. I watched, was, I watched that movie. It was very funny. It, <laughs> absolutely. It was, it was the first, it was the, one of the first films to go on Netflix in 2014. It was the first film to show an Africa magic Igbo. It was the first Igbo film to win an AMVCA. It was the first Igbo film to win an AMA award. It, 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 so whatever the story that I take, whatever the concept, whatever the genre, 
I put my soul into it. So I refuse to be pigeonholed in this statement that says, oh, I want to tell a story a particular way. No, I want to be a, a, a Steven Spielberg who could pick a biopic, like I picked Badamasi about Babangida, and I made it work. It, it was hugely successful. It still uh, is on, um, on Amazon Prime, where it's showing. It, 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 I could take cybersecurity, as I did with blackmail, and make it work. So at the bottom of everything we do, at the, at the heart of everything we do, perspective, or you tell it, so long as you tell the story from the heart, you will have the audience. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. You tell stories. Never the story. That's, that's a I good tell one. You tell heart. stories from the heart. You're a man of the heart. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, I'm still talking to Obi. My name is I'm still Obi, so I'm the heart man. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I'm just talking to Obi Emelo, yeah? CNN's uh, feature of Nollywood personality, membership, with membership of the UK Film Directors and the British Film Institute. And he tells his stories from the heart. It either that tells his stories from the heart. Now, I, there's this perspective about, you know, women, feminine, fem, fe, you know, fem, fem, feminism, you know, that is growing now in Nigeria, that is picking up in Nigeria, you know, where uh, if, if you place male vis-a-vis -vis females and you begin to tell stories, it could be a growing culture over there in the UK, but it's also growing here in Nigeria where women are beginning to assert themselves. Would you also tell a story from the heart? Or have you told a story from the heart already? I, I, with the way I celebrate my wife, with the way I celebrate the women in my life, my mom and my wife and my sister, you, you, you can tell that I, I value the inputs, the invaluable inputs of women folk. And I try to reflect that in the story that I tell. So the, the next film that I'm working on involves the, the, the female perspective, just like the mirror boy was also the perspective of the mother who goes through this turmoil with a missing son in, in the middle of a uh, market in Africa when they came back from the UK. I try to provide a, a gendered view of, of the concepts I'm dealing with, irrespective of what that concept is. Last flight, Abuja had a female pilot. I could have made it two pilots. At the time, there weren't many female pilots in 2012 when I made it. But I made it with a female pilot just to make the statement that women are capable of doing anything they put set their minds on. I have a daughter who's going to be a medical doctor. And she decided she was going to do it. I said, go ahead. You, you decide, you do it. Nobody can stop you. Your, your, your gender cannot stop you. So I've always had a very gendered perspective on, on most of the stories that I tell. And the world is only beginning to catch up. Unfortunately, as with everything in life, there is an extreme of it where everybody, be, where people begin to, you know, to compare apples with oranges, compare males with females. Each of those sexes has its own uniqueness, its own power. And there's no need to compare. You cannot compare with the fish in swimming. It would outrun you. It would outswim you. But bring the fish to the to the to, to, to dry dry land and you and you show it who is boss. So it is about valuing people, seeing people as a team, as a member of the team. When I when I mentioned that I played football, what I get from football is that you need a team to win. You cannot buy the best players like Chelsea have and start winning games immediately. No. They have to gel as a team before they can start winning. So women are part of the, the team that everybody needs to succeed. The film industry needs to succeed. So I, I tell stories that are gendered. I tell stories with female central characters. I give my actors and actresses the best opportunity to be the best they can be. I celebrate what they do. I celebrate the women in my life. And you don't have to pick up arms to now start a war between males and females. No. Everybody plays their role, and the world is a better place. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm valuing the fact that you, you're talking about family, your wife, your mother, maybe your daughters too. I'm looking at a situation where this uh, sense of, you could call it, war of the sexes is beginning to destroy you know, family values. I mean, in the case of Nigeria, it's becoming rife, where you have separations, you have divorces, you have all kinds of things happening, and the family is not holding together again. I mean, I mean, what's your comment? 
you know, I celebrated 20 years of marriage with my wife um, in February this year. And, and one of the things that I posted on social media was that every marriage needs an ambassador. Every marriage needs more than love. Love is not enough. Mm. That I love him, I love her, is not enough. Because there are times when we fall short of the patience, of the tolerance, of the um, forgiveness that is necessary to make a stranger into a spouse. In those times, we need somebody who's fair, who we trust, who we believe in, who we respect to come in and play the referee. Not to say who wins and who loses, but to just give you a different perspective, to say, sit down. Have you thought about this from your wife's perspective? Have you thought about this from your husband's perspective? This is your position. We are not Oyibo people, law. Irrespective of where we live, we are still Nigerians. And let's remember that we come from somewhere. We are a people that you say that your mom and your dad are still living together 90 years after they got married and your dad celebrates your mom every day. Have you asked your mom what she had to do for that to happen? Because there's a give and take. You cannot come home and pretend that you are the boss of the house. And yet, when there's a knock on the door that is loud, you send the man to go and die. No, you play your role. That role is to nurture the family, to nourish the family in whatever way it is. The man's role is different from, from your role, especially when it comes to children. So if you start to compare whose trousers are longest uh, or, or whose, whose um, skirts are shortest, you miss the point. And that is what's happening with most of our relationships, that people refuse their traditional positions in life, in a family's life. And yet, they want the traditional benefits of marriage. If you don't want to get married, it's fine. Do your thing, be single. But if you want to get married, you have to compromise. You cannot say, take me as I am or leave it. No, I cannot take you as, a, as I am. If, if you want me to take you as you are, take me as I am. <laughs> so there's always a case of, you know what? I have to compromise a little bit on my values to accommodate somebody else. I want my bed to be uh, warm, but the person who is on the other side of the bed wants the bed to be cold too. So I have to get an agreement where the bed is lukewarm. I, I, I like my, my, my room to be very tidy, as if it's a showroom. However, the other person is a bit careless with things. So accommodate a little bit of careless. Talk about it, get them to improve, but don't kick them out because they, they, they are untidy. Because they're not you. Remember, this guy is a stranger. The only thing that has brought two of you together is the agreement to love each other. And that agreement doesn't erase, eradicate all the differences that you came with. You met as adults. You have disagreements with your brothers and sisters. What is more, a stranger who's coming to your life when you are about 35? It's difficult. Well, so it is the constant work that is required. Yeah, that's, that a, that's, a, good, that's a good one. Most of the people in our industry most of the people in our industry get carried away by the glamour. That's a good one. I, I, I also hope our, fem our filmmakers will begin to, you know, uh, I mean, indoctrinate that into our stories or insert that into our stories, ingrain that into our stories to build family and something family. You've said so much. I, my next question will have, you know, talked about what you've covered so much. You talk about global uh, outreach for Nollywood and profitability. You talk about the expansion of global investment. You've even spoken about marketing in the diaspora and African markets, just so that we we'll know that I, I keep going back to the industriousness of the Igbo guy. You can't beat that, Mr. Obi. You cannot beat that. Nigeria. 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 <laughs> you cannot beat that, my brother. <laughs> you cannot beat that. So, yeah, so the next question. You have a very strong sense of social, uh, corporate social responsibility in your programs like OB, Emilonye, you know, Foundation, 2050 Legacy, and Crazy Lovely Cool. Can you, I mean, explain that to our, you know, our audience and, you know, to show how you've given back to the society? You know, it's, um, you get to a certain, a certain stage in your life and it stops being about you. 
It's not about winning the next award. It's not about getting billion dollars. You've had a good innings, as they say in cricket. You've had a good life. And, and you look back and say, there are people who are starting off like I did a few years ago who would need the help that I needed at that time that are not getting it. So uh, there are lots of creative people. And, and the thing about Nollywood is that it, it has very low entry barriers. Whoever you are, whatever your educational standards, you'll find a place, so long as you have a passion for the industry. So I, I, as I turned 50 a few years ago, many years now, uh, I felt that it was the right time to, to decentralize myself as the focus of, of what I do um, and to try and use my influence and my contacts to lift other people. Um, so I, I started the Obia Millennium Foundation to primarily help people who are interested in the film industry to, to find a foothold. Um, and one of the first things we did was uh, uh, a co-production with Trace TV, a crazy lovely co, which uh, we shot at the University of Nigeria, Soka. And the idea was to get a bunch of, you know, decent, well-known people, Enyin Namwiwe, Adesuwa Itomi, and, and the likes, and combine them with a bunch of unknowns from the university where I studied in Nigeria, University of Nigeria, and Soka, and give those young people the pedestal to go on and become somebody. And that's what we did. In, in a few years after that, I, I also made another TV series called Crazy Lovely Cook, called um, Heart and Soul, which is streaming on Netflix too, where there was not one well-known person. Everybody was a fresher. I organized a, um, a training workshop in Lagos, um, but at the back of my mind, it was an audition. I didn't want to say it was an audition. If I said it was an audition, a lot of people would come who are just interested in the glamour. But I wanted people who wanted to learn. And I said it was a workshop. And the, the, you know, about 100 people showed up. I did the workshop. But at the end of it, I cast the film. At the end of the workshop, I told people, OK, you're playing this. We're starting shooting two days' time. Yeah, you're playing this role. You're playing that role. About 80% of the people that came to that workshop were part of the film. Um, Excellent. It's on Netflix now. It's been Excellent. Uh, Excellent. But over the years, over the years also, my my work, my um, corporate social respons responsibility work has transcended film. So in 2010, I I donated a kidney to my younger brother um, to save his life. Um, and 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 almost every year we have somebody in Nollywood who has kidney problems, who needs contribution to go to hospital or to go to India for an operation and stuff like that. And there are very little things that we could do as a people to look after ourselves and to safeguard um, kidney problems that are that have become acute. So part of the work that I do now every year is to, first of all, promote that, you know, you can donate a kidney, it wouldn't kill you. It actually made me healthier and made me more successful if you look at it critically, because at the time I, I, I gave the kidney to my brother in 2010, I just finished shooting The Mirror Boy. And the guy that woke up from the theater um, bench is a different guy from the guy that, that was put to sleep. And since then, it's been, you know, transcendental success. So it, it, it would not kill you. And if you, need, if you have somebody who needs it and you are you are tested and you are able to, to, to donate, please do. But you don't have to donate. All you have to do is look after yourself, at least. Look after your kidney. And our, in our industry, we have a lot of problems with kidney, and it's because of the lifestyle. Make the changes to the lifestyle. Do some tests occasionally to find out how well you are doing in, in those areas. And, and part of what I do now is to send that word out there. And if it saves one life, if it saves two people, then it would have been successful. So beyond film, beyond everything else that we do, it's to create that awareness that we all need to support each other. We all need to look after our health because health is number one. I can only say you are everywhere. That's why I said you, you're you wearing coat of many colors. I've been talking to OBA Molinier, CNN's feature of Lonely Wood Personality, member of the UK Film Directors, 
and a member of the British Film Institute, the BFI. It's so nice to have had you on Film Talk. I, sorry, I bite into your time. I know UK is a busy place, but here in Nigeria, we're a bit, you know, a little bit relaxed. <laughs> so, so, so I, I kept coming to you in the morning. Sorry about that. Thank you so much for coming on Film Talk. Thank you so much. You can find us on, you know, Instagram and Facebook. Thank you, Obi. Thank you so much.